This is part two of my video on mini safaris, which might be where you're asking what now. Of course, besides what this video is going to show, you may also feel free to reach out, contact me at markeastburn.com, which is my website, Instagram, mark.eastburn, Twitter, at markeastburn, or my email address is right there as well, in case you're interested, especially when we get to the photos and the and the image sharing, if you're interested in pursuing uh, a little more as far as what investigations can show, or sharing data with me, I'd be more than happy to hear from any one of you. This is related to the book that I developed for the National Science Teaching Association, which is Home is Where My Habitat Is, which features the story of a jumping spider, the only known jumping spider that eats plants. Inside the ebook itself, there's a lot of ways that one might explore a habitat in another part of the world. This is the tropical dry forest of Costa Rica. And there are some very similar activities to what I was suggesting students do in part one of my video, where they start to learn about places such as the forest floor or the uh, area in a backyard, under some bricks, under a flower pot, uh, in, a, in a park near a, a city area. Um, there's another place you might be able to look. And here we're investigating different animals that can live in the Costa Rican dry forest on the forest floor. They would also collect data on these organisms. And this is something else that I wanted to hopefully lead teachers and parents through as a way of connecting students to real world application of these skills. And let me go back to the PowerPoint presentation that I had set up. I also will have a video that will feature Are They the Same? That's another book that I wrote for the National Science Teaching Association. But right now I'll focus on Home is Where My Habitat Is and the isopod habitats that we set up in the previous video. What students often do is they'll learn how to distinguish between animals that are iconic and compelling and interesting, but not necessarily relevant to where they might live. Um, I remember when my own children were in first grade, one of the things that they learned were the differences between African and Asian elephants. And while I certainly don't have any argument with that sort of an activity, although I might say that there are two types of African elephant, the bush elephant and the forest elephant, beyond that, we're learning to look at characteristics of an animal that really isn't something that students would encounter in their everyday lives. Isopods are. Now, if I looked at this, vi this image, I would be able to tell you that there are three different species of isopod. Uh, and hopefully with a little bit of practice, students would be able to distinguish between the different species of isopod as well. Now, I've included scientific names for these isopods as well as common names. Students really don't have a huge trouble or a huge amount of trouble with scientific names. Pachycephalosaurus wyomingensis, uh, many dinosaurs are only known by their scientific names, Tyrannosaurus rex being the most iconic of them. I wouldn't think that children would necessarily have trouble saying these names if we relate them to dinosaurs or something else that they might be more familiar with um, in terms of large names. I know certainly children don't shy away from big names of dinosaurs, neither should they shy away from big names for animals that are alive today. I've also included common names for these species, but we have the rough wood louse and the common wood louse. Both of these are those species that I said were more of a flat organism. They might run a little bit faster. The armadillidium, the pill bugs, are the ones that can roll up into a small bowl, ball. And um, they have that defensive strategy when they get scared. They may not run as fast as the wood lice. They will roll up into a ball. These ones are also called sow bugs or sow bugs. They are um, the ones that are flat, oftentimes found in close proximity with the pill bugs. But the way you can distinguish them is that the pill bugs will roll up. Both of these pill bugs belong to a scientific genus named 
armadillidium, and then we have armadillidium vulgari, which is very common in many parts of the world. Armadillidium nasatum, which happens to be very common where I live in Pennsylvania and could be common in other places. The Porcelio scaber, this rough wood louse, is also fairly common, as is the common wood louse, Aniscus ocellus. These are all, however, European species, primarily from England, that were brought over by the settlers in the colonial times. For a little bit better look at the common pill bug, this is a shinier species. When light hits it, it makes that shine. It can be darker, although you will see they can be many different colors. They will roll up into a ball, much like the, the other pill bugs that you've seen. I actually happen to breed pill bugs and some of the wood lice also. I have a variety of colors. Children, when they're out in, in their local area collecting isopods, they might find different colors. I'll show you in some of my photographs some of the differently colored isopods that I have in my area. This is an Armadillidium vulgari. I can tell because it has kind of yellowish markings, although they can be a solid color. It also has the shiny texture to its carapace or its exoskeleton, as we might call that. I have another example of an Armadillidium vulgari, and if students find orange ones, they are very interesting, uh, very surprising to see sometimes. I also have some bright yellow ones. I have some pinkish ones as well. But what we're looking for in terms of identifying Armadillidium vulgari, encouraging students to really look, is it shiny, for example? Is it kind of a smooth carapace, a smooth exoskeleton? That's part of that shininess comes from that smoothness. Though, and does it roll up into a ball? Those are things that we would encourage students to look for in terms of distinguishing from one species to another. We want to kind of get an idea of the diversity of habitats or the diversity of organisms that live in a habitat, as is the theme of home is where my habitat is. And in order to do that, we need to establish how many different species might live in a particular area. Very relevant to a local habitat if we focus on isopod species. These are the organisms that we don't necessarily pay very much attention to. However, we really need to start gathering data on these sorts of organisms because if there is an environmental concern, if there is something that's going wrong with the environment, these sorts of organisms can be great environmental indicators of those upcoming problems. Now I see my formatting is a little bit off here. I apologize. Here we have Armadillidium nasatum. This is not my best picture, but what you can see just like the vulgari, they will roll up into a ball. They have a kind of a sandpapery, more of a sandpapery, grainy, gritty exoskeleton. They're not nearly as shiny. They also have this pattern, almost like a, a feathered pattern or a, a fishbone pattern going down their bodies. That's how you can distinguish Armadillidium nasatum from Armadillidium vulgari. They will both roll up into balls, but the Armadillidium nasatum is not nearly as shiny, and it does have some sort of a pattern on its back that's more of a gray, dark gray, not so much with the yellow like the Armadillidium vulgari might have. I have to fix this a little bit too. This is an example of a different color, different colorations of Armadillidium nasatum. The shininess you might see is from dew drops when I took these pictures, but we have some that are more of a brownish color, still have that same sort of a patterning, bright orange one here, but still has that same general patterning that you would see in the Armadillidium nasatum. I would really encourage students to try to identify the differences and identify these species. They could share pictures with each other. Teachers could share pictures with their students and ask them to identify what species they are. I'm also more than happy myself to take a look at certain po photos that teachers might want to share with me and be able to tell them what species uh, they are actually seeing. Moving on, we have the rough wood louse, which you can tell is rough because it has a very bumpy exoskeleton. It's not shiny, definitely not shiny like Armadillidium vulgari. 
And if you do have any trouble, there is a little bit of a harder time distinguishing between the wood lice, possibly. You might have a little bit harder time because there are more species. If you want to contact me in order to get more information, here's my contact information again through Instagram, Twitter, or email. I'm more than happy to discuss what you might find in a local habitat somewhere near you or what your students may find, uh, your children if you're a parent watching this as well. Here's another shot of a Porcelio scaber. Now these are much flatter. They're, they have a wider body as well. And like I said, I do breed these. So students might find orange ones. They might find multicolored ones. These are some that were isolated originally in Maryland, I believe. So they might actually get very excited to find different colorations of isopods uh, in their area. And what they need to understand is just like all dogs are the same species, all cats are the same species. Isopods can be different colors and still belong to the same species. We're trying to look for other distinguishing features, such as does it roll up into a ball? This one does not. It would run away. It would not be able to roll up into a ball. It's a much wider sort of isopod than the than the pill bugs, and it's much flatter than the pill bugs would be. The pill bugs tend to have much more of a, a domed uh, appearance than, than the sow bugs do or the, the wood lice do. The other species we found when I was looking outside was the common wood louse. This is Aniscus ocellus. This tends to be in areas that are wetter. As you'll see where I gathered data, I counted up all of the wood lice and all of the isopods that I could find in different locations, all of the pill bugs and the, the wood lice. And what I was able to find was that there's a very big difference in what I was able to find in different areas, all not too far away from where I live. The Aniscus ocellus also can have some different color variations, but this is a larger wood louse. It lives in damper places. It's flat. It can't roll up into a ball. That's why it's more of a, a wood louse or a sow bug. It's fairly fast running as well. And it has a flat body, as you can see right here. These are all Aniscus ocellus, the common wood louse. These are the four kinds of isopods that you'd be most likely to find in the United States, Canada, um, and England as well, because they're very common in the United Kingdom. What I would hope to get to a point, I showed this at the beginning, what I would hope to get to a point is where someone might be able to identify all of the species that they see in this one image. And... After some practice, and I did include, and I will include with this, with this unit, I will include some coloring sheets where students might have a chance to color and become more familiar with the colorations, the textures, the sizes, the abilities of each of these different species. As they look at them, apologize for flipping through so quickly, they would be able to look at an image like this and tell me, well, this has bumpy... A bumpy exoskeleton. It looks fairly flat. It's fairly wide. This would be a rough wood louse. This would be Porcelio scaber if they really want to learn the scientific names as well. This has very much the same sort of traits. So these two are the same species. They're both rough wood lifes. This one is a little bit out of focus, but you can still see the bumpiness. That's a third one, still in the same group. Here, you may remember that patterning that I pointed out earlier. That's Armadillidium nasatum. These are the ones that can roll up into a ball. They are not nearly as shiny as the one other species we have here, which is an Armadillidium vulgari. This one is a shiny one. You can kind of get the idea just the way the sunlight is hitting it, although I did take this picture on a cloudy day. But we can see one, two, three Armadillidium nasatum, one, two, three Porcelio scaber, and one Armadillidium vulgari. If you want to use their common names only, nosy isopod, nosy isopod, they get that nosy name because they have what looks like a little nose here in the front of their face. And then we have the rough wood lice, and we have a common pill bug, nosy, the nosy pill bug. I may have said that uh, incorrectly. Uh, let me correct myself now. So I have the nosy pill bug, the nosy pill bug, nosy pill bug, rough wood louse, rough wood louse, rough wood louse, and common pill bug, the Armadillidium vulgari. 
I apologize if I confused those names earlier. I'm very used to looking at these or knowing these by their scientific names. Here we see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight, twenty nine, thirty, thirty one, thirty two, thirty three, thirty four, thirty five, approximately thirty five armadillidium nasatum or nosy pill bugs, and we have one armadillidium vulgari or the common pill bug. From there, I wanted to show you some of the data that I was able to collect. And even first graders, second graders, they're working with graphing. So in order to get a little bit of an idea what they might be able to find, here we have uh, some of the data I collected. This was in my backyard. I live in Levittown, Pennsylvania. I found throughout my my backyard, I found 12 of the common pill bug, 178 of the rough wood lice, 217 of the nosy pill bugs, and I didn't find any of the common wood louse, the one that I said is more common in wetter areas. I went to that rural area. It was a, it was a fairly large park by the canal in a town called Yardley, Pennsylvania. There I wasn't able to find any common pill bugs or nosy pill bugs, no pill bugs whatsoever. Only found two rough wood, li wood lice and nine of the common wood lice. I did show a video of one of the ones that I found. This is a question as far as why do we find so many, so many more where I happen to live as opposed to a natural area. It would seem that you would find more in the natural area than you would find in a, a backyard. The answer in my suspicion is that in Yardley, we still have some predators. We have box turtles. Box turtles love to eat isopods, so that might be keeping their numbers down. Whereas in my backyard, I do have a small habitat where I actually do have some, some turtles and tortoises, but right now they're in hibernating, and also they can't access these areas where all of these pill bugs and wood lice were found. If you have a wild area where turtles can roam free, box turtles especially, they'll find the places where the wood lice and the pill bugs are and actually be able to eat them. In Trenton, the city that I also visited, I only found eight of the common pill bugs and five of the rough wood lice. I didn't find any of the nosy pill bugs or any of the common wood lice, the Aniscus ocellus. This is probably because it wasn't wet enough. They do like the damp dampness. These I mostly found around a creek. These I found nowhere near in that in that park that I was looking around. What might have been happening then is that, that these are just a lot tougher. The common pill bugs, they really live pretty much anywhere in the United States. They are just a lot tougher of an organism for some reason. I can't really explain why I didn't find any of the nosy pill bugs unless my area, they just happen to find something that allows them to live better. There's some kind of a habitat condition in my area that's much more beneficial to them than in Trenton, New Jersey. It could be a food source. It could be all of the concrete and cement that I have around my house, although you would also find that in a city. So these are things that teachers and parents and students might be able to investigate. What is the best kind of a situation for isopods, pill bugs to live? And of course, we could also graph what we've discovered, and we can choose all sorts of ways to uh, present our data. I think I need to find the right. Now this will auto automatically go to a pie chart. So I could say um, isopods in Levittown, Pennsylvania. <coughs> Excuse me. And It helps if I spell it right. Then I might also have that compared to what was found in Yardley. Now, this is not a numerical comparison. It's a percentage comparison. <coughs> this is what um, Google is autocorrecting. 
This is would be in Yardley. Now, if I did want to, instead of comparing them in terms of percentages, I'll just include this one as well. So where I live is pretty much right across the river from Trenton, New Jersey. Trenton, New Jersey is not very far from me. It's actually closer to me than Yardley, Pennsylvania is. So these three locations, if I wanted to do anything different with these data, I could change the type of chart that I'm working with. I could change it from a pie chart to a a um, bar graph, which we would see here, that the common pill bug is more common than the rough wood louse. I could also change that with all of these. And this is something students might want to get some practice doing, a teacher might want to get some practice doing, because this is really one thing that's going to be very essential in science as they mature as scientists, is that they will have to become familiar with whoops become familiar with ways of presenting data and ways of understanding data that meets math standards as well looking at graphs and telling you telling me which one is more common in which area uh, if we're looking at just complete numbers here we can see that certain species whoops i duplicated this one and i didn't do where the numbers are the greatest so let me make that chart. You can look at the scale here. That's one of the cross-cutting concepts is scale. This scale is with the numbers re being fit, jumping up by 50s and this scale jumping up by 2s and this one by 2s. That's a big difference. Cross-cutting concept is scale. So really, if we put these together, what sort of data would we be able to find? We would realize that these numbers are far smaller than the numbers you would see on here. That's something to discuss with students is scale. It's a very important um, concept that they will need to know. Uh, it's very important for many science standards. Now, I also did the times of the nosy pill bug. If you remember my first video, is timing the time it took them to walk out of a circle compared to the rough wood louse, the Porcelio scaber, the one that is much flatter. And what I did was I had all of these. These are the seconds. These are what my timer told me each time I put this, the isopod in the middle of that circle and then had it run out. And then I just inserted a function, which I find right here. I did the average function. And I just chose my cells, which are H2 to H11. And it would give me an average value for each of these. This is something else. You may want students to start getting familiar with ways of manipulating data, ways of actually calculating. This is a spreadsheet. These are very useful as students mature. I was working... For many years as an elementary science teacher, found these introductions to spreadsheets to be useful. And then by the time they get to high school, they're really using these to make graphical representations of their data and to process their data as well. So finding averages, for example, is a very important skill that students really should be building. And the younger you can teach them at least some basic skills with this kind of software, the better they're going to be they're more confident they're going to be as they get older. So this would be I, uh, that would be I2 to I11. I already did calculate the averages, but I figured I'd put them back in. Now these two values, again, which one is faster? You could ask them, is the nosy pill bug faster, the rough wood louse faster? Now what they need to understand here is actually less intuitive because if you say which is the faster one, they might not necessarily realize that the faster one is going to be the one with the lower number than the one with the higher number. The nosy pill bug took longer to run out of the circle. It took more seconds. So that means it's actually slower. Whereas the rough wood louse 
this is the the time it took to go that that this was actually um i had to use a slightly larger circle this was actually five centimeters instead of um the the four centimeters that i made previously now what i could do was i could actually calculate the speed that each of these traveled what what might help students understand this a little bit better is to actually do the velocity or the speed which would be the the distance over time in this case they were the distance was five centimeters and the time was in this case 5.81 sec seconds and in this case 2.01 seconds now there may be a faster way of doing this but i i'm just going to do 5.5 .5, which is the distance divided by 5.81 which is the time and i end up getting they go 0 0.86, so it's less than one centimeter a second, whereas my, my, my rough wood louse, the faster species, went five centimeters in 2.01 seconds, which means it went easily two, two and a half times faster, uh, almost three times faster, the rough wood louse went three times faster than the nosy pill bug. Would students be able to handle all of these decimals in first or second grade? Of course not. But would they be able to see this number is two and this number is zero and that this is a bigger number than this one and be able to answer that one species of isopod is faster than another? Sure. And then they might actually start thinking about the adaptations. Why is it that this rough wood louse, the Porcelio scaber, which I had here why is that one a faster runner than the one that can roll up into a ball well it may be that the one that is a faster runner has to get away from danger whereas the pill bug might actually be able to roll itself into a ball and escape trouble i hope this is all helpful information and with this i will be more than willing and more than happy to discuss things further at my website or through these ways of contact me which I'll put here big on the on the screen feel free to reach out anytime thank you very much